Fermenting has become wildly popular in the last decade. Everywhere you look, people are drinking kombucha and water kefir, and other folks are making fermented pickles and sauerkraut or homemade yogurts. In each of these examples, the goal is to make an environment beneficial to microorganisms so they thrive and multiply. This is the same thing that probiotic farmers are trying to do. Instead of just trying to jam the plant full of nutrients, a probiotic farmer is creating a soil environment where life is abundant and naturally creates the plant's nutrition. A thriving plant comes from making healthy soil, not trying to force feed it nutrients. Korean natural farming, known shorthand as KNF, is next level probiotic farming. KNF ferments a wide variety of naturally occurring substances, from plant and fruit juices to fish carcasses and seawater, in order to help indigenous bacteria, fungi, nematodes, and protozoa to thrive and produce fertile soils that don't require pesticides, herbicides, or synthetic fertilizer inputs. In essence, KNF takes the principles found in making tasty-to-eat kimchi and reapplies them to the farm. Master Cho Han Ku invented Korean natural farming method by blending Korean farming and fermenting techniques with those of natural farming teachers he met while studying in Japan. By 1992, he had begun an epic 21-part series in Modern Agriculture magazine on his newly established methods, and in 1995, he opened the Natural Farming Life School and Research Farm in Korea. This school is the source of these inventive techniques that are taking the cannabis world by storm. Seriously, everybody in probiotic cannabis growing is talking about CANF right now. If you want to learn about cannabis health, business, and technique efficiently and with good cheer, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. Every week, you'll receive a new podcast episode delivered right to your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items from the week and videos, too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new episode is published. Sign up for the updates and make sure you don't miss an episode. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Los. My guest this week is Chris Trump. Chris Trump is a master natural farmer certified by Master Cho of Korea. He's also studied microbial analysis under Dr. Elaine Ingram. Many consider Chris's YouTube videos explaining Korean natural farming techniques to have been the key to KNF's wildly increasing popularity in the U.S. It's also helpful that Chris is a certified KNF educator who actually speaks English. Today we'll be going over the central ideas of KNF and discussing recipes for Korean farming's exceptionally alive inputs. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I know your time is valuable, so thanks for peeling off a little bit for us. So, you know, you know, as I've already mentioned to folks, uh, I am new to Korean natural farming. I've been into probiotics for a while, but um, but people have been getting more and more excited about KNF as the as the teaching finds its way you know, around the scene. And so, so let's start, like, what do you see as the difference between, um, you know, probiotic farming and living soils versus the specifics of Korean natural farming? Is it, is it simply a subset of uh, probiotic farming or do you see it kind of as an, as its own thing for some reason? You know, it's, it's all, it's all nature. Um, the best any of this is really doing is, working uh, the way nature already works in its optimum. So um, if somebody's doing probiotic farming or um, living, focusing on living soil, if they're doing it well, um, you know, that's, that's kind of, it is very similar. Um, Korean natural farming, um, one of the core principles is the idea of indigenous microbes. So, um, where you might buy bugs in a jug, some, some product made somewhere um, that somebody said is really good or they found success with, um, those uh, we found may or may not persist in your environment. So um, depending on your temperature or your moisture um, or just the microbes that are already present, you might have a six-month fall off with some sort of purchased um, microorganism mix. And you might, you might not. That's not, I'm not saying that's always how it is. But with indigenous biology, so if you're 
uh, indigenous microorganisms. If you're farming uh, an acre of land and you go up the hill and you collect something that exists in the wild forest and bring it down, um, we're very confident that that will persist in your soil because it's for however many thousands of years or whatever period of time that's been undisturbed or gotten established, it's thrived in that environment. So by moving it, you know, downhill or a mile across town, um, it's still going to like your rainfall, your temperature, your barometric pressure, and the general soil mix for the most part, and, and even play well with the microbes on your farm. That makes a lot of sense. You know, we talk a lot on this show about bioregions and making sure that you're growing, you know, the, the strains that work for where you live if you're growing outdoors. And this seems to be a real obvious uh, ex extension of that. You know, it's like, you know, work with the microbes that are comfortable with your area and your weather instead of, you know, necessarily recruiting um, bugs in a bottle, like you said, uh, to add them and then just hope that they do good where you happen to live. That makes a lot of sense. And so, so at the at the at the cornerstone of KNF would be simply uh, recruiting your volunteer microbes from your neighborhood and then feeding them what they want so that they are uh, you know motivated to stay and to increase. Yeah, and and that's not to say that bugs in a bugs in a jug wouldn't help your farm. It just may be that you just got to keep buying them. Whereas um, if you're, yeah, if you're establishing something that will persist, um, you're basically building a battery of health and uh, vitality in your soil that will be there year after year. Right on. Um, so you mentioned that as one of the key tenants of KNF. Uh, would you would you have any other key tenants of KNF that you think are good to start with? You know, um, the first time I spent a long period of time with uh, Cho Han Yu, um, Master Cho. He, I, we looked at our notes. I was sitting next to my friend, Pancho San Pedro, who's uh, the head of Crazy Horse. You know Neil Young, Crazy Horse? The yeah, band. yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's the he's Crazy Horse. And uh, we're sitting there, and we're looking at our notes. It's been a day or two of, you know, getting into it. Master Cho and his daughter was there, Ju Young. And uh, we're like, every other word, love. You know, like this whole thing, there's like agriculture, agriculture, love. Agriculture, love. And uh, so that's taken me a bit, or initially it took me a bit as a commercial farmer to be like, okay, what does love have to do with agriculture? And um, But I would say, as far as natural farming goes, it is a core tenant in, in, in that it's... Uh, it's a mindset or a position to farm from where if you are caring for things um, or treating them as you might a child, you know, where it's like, oh, it's just good enough, but you're, you're kind of like, no, let me practice or learn to do this well. Um, there's, there's a result that is, um, has to do with this, kind of invisible component that is the farmer's attention. And we have that. I mean, that's culturally, we've seen that over the years. You have these sayings in livestock, you know, the uh, eye of the farmer fattens the cow yeah. or the sh shadow of the farmer makes the plants grow. And um, it's, those are nods towards something that's uh, the invisible component. And um, yeah, so there's, there's that in there. Uh, that that's kind of a, a deeper philosophical uh, rabbit trail, but it is it is important um, in this type of agriculture in the communication of it. I would think that just about anybody who's attracted to either you know just generally probiotic growing or specifically KNF, they've got to have some of that in their heart, though, right? Because you know generally people who are you know ruthlessly corporate growers, they're growing out of bottles and they are pushing uh, nature to take from nature to get nature to produce for them. Versus all the farmers that I know who are using probiotic growing techniques are doing it 
it because they're in love with the plant. They're in love with their land. They don't want to have, you know, uh, evil runoff of their property going into the streams. I, I would say that just, you know, farmers generally with love in their hearts will find their way to this kind of farming one, you know, eventually. Yeah, I, I would think so. And, and that's not to say it's not this, like, it's, it's not to say it's not about being profitable. Like it isn't there. They aren't mutually exclusive um, to have a care for what you're doing or profitability. It's you can, there's definitely both. Um, you know, as we toured Korea, um, one of the only things he would ask, uh, master Cho would ask these farmers doing natural farming is, um, you know, how much money are you making? You know, and they're obviously caring for what they do. I mean, they have, you know, whether it's pigs or crops, just beautiful and Mac, I was pretty jealous when I saw a persimmon farm where it's just like they don't they haven't fertilized in eleven years and they just have it looks like twenty three acres of a tree that if you know, Mr. Miyagi had one <laughs> baby, he would have you know, it's like twenty three acres of perfectly groomed, beautifully productive persimmons and they haven't fertilized in eleven years. Um but he asked them how much money they make. And they're, uh, by and large, the answers I heard, they're far more profitable than we are in the U.S. Um, because some some of that has to do with its family operations where they're not paying workman's comp. You know, they're running these, these things with, you know, two people, a husband and wife, and they're killing it on a couple acres. And, um, but yeah, it's, Anyways, I just wanted to clarify, just because we're talking about love doesn't mean it's not viable to um, make a living on as a person or family farm. Um, it's uh, very much about um, sustainability, meaning that you don't have to work a second job to sustain your farming habit. Yeah, that, I think that's a good thing for you to point out too, especially since a, you know a great deal of of the audience uh, for this show are commercial cannabis growers, right? You know, we there are people who they want to, you know, they they may have the heart and the love, but at the end of the day, they need to make sure that what they're growing has got high yield, uh, is is mm. developing a fantastic terpene profile, and that they're locking down as much bag appeal as they can without going indoors. And and you know, if if people knew that that they, they could use this tech, these techniques, but they would lose money. Well, they sure as heck wouldn't be as popular, but, but, you know, we, we know darn well that using probiotic and, and KNF techniques actually just makes the plant thrive. And then, and then also, so your yields are going up and, and so is the quality of your product. So, all right. I think we finally hit that pretty well. So, um, so, you know, uh, no-till is also becoming really popular. Is Would you consider no-till to be an essential part of KNF as well because you don't want to break up the the community and the soil? Yeah, it's, it's definitely um, in the same line. Um, if you're – with natural farming, you're not, you're not tilling um, as a general rule. Um, if, you're, if you're coming into a – brand new area and it's full of grass or um, some other, um, you know, wild crop uh, or, or weed, um, you're, you're probably going to have to deal with that in that first season. Um, and so that's encouraged that you're not beating your head against the wall trying to grow around or through the grass that's super thick and beating out or out competing. You may need to till or spade or do something the first time, but yeah, de definitely. Um, cause we're, we're counting on that, that network that is established of the fungal network and all these, um, little organisms, part of the soil food web to grow the food. So going in and slamming them all with, um, equipment, uh, at the end of every season is kind of counterproductive. When I was first starting to read about KNF, one of the things that, you know, one of the one of the explanations that really hit me was about soil nutrient cycling. And you actually just hit it talking about that persimmon farm. And so I'm going to set you up and I'd like you to just kind of explain it a little bit because you said that that persimmon farm that you saw had not fertilized in like 11 years. And and that's a perfect example because normally the, the the trees get rid of the leaves and and then they're there then they are in the soil and then they rot and so the plant is self fertilizing um can you go a little more in depth about that 
Yeah, there's um, natural farming. Um, I guess the the principle in nutrition is the right amount at the right time um, means that you can have far less quantity of input than if you're just trying to preload um, a whole growing cycle's food in the beginning. Um, so like that persimmon farm, I mean, they, they use a lot of um, composting, you know, or, or um, mulching. So they mulch, but, um, but not, um, not a ton of nitrogen. They, they don't need to. The rainfall is sufficient. Um, yeah, it, with, depending on your crop, some crops need, they really do need um, uh, nitrogen in their vegetative growth cycle especially. Um, and so there is um, nutrients available, but like we, we farm 750 acres of macadamia nuts with natural farming in Hawaii organically. And the amount of nitrogen we use on our farm now, it's all grown with Korean natural farming, um, is homeopathic, um, to put a descriptive word to it, um, compared to the industry recommended nitrogen amounts. And, uh, the experts in our industry look at it and they're like, well, you'll, you'll never get yields with that amount of nitrogen. And now, you know, five years later, they're like, so what are you doing? <laughs> Will you speak at our international conference? You know, like, um, because our yields are increasing year after year. We're, we're getting increased yields while our entire island yields are in decline. And they're thinking, well, the trees are too old. Well, we have the oldest trees on the island on our farm. And uh, we're increasing year after year with this tending to the life of the soil. So, so uh, going back to the persimmon example, so since so since on this show we're, we're our, you know our our, cro- our target crop is cannabis, and and since the persimmon tree you know to its um, to its advantage, you know, the leaves fall and it's already used the key components to make the tree. And then when the, and then in the fall they fall. And so they, 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 then they rot at the base of the tree and then they go into the soil. And so it's kind of self self fertilizing since that's mm-hmm. not the case with cannabis plants. Essentially what we're trying to do is to um, feed the microorganisms that are in the soil um, and kind of replace what would happen if we just let the cannabis plants go through their season and then degrade and die, you know, after they seed the soil below them uh, mm-hmm. so that they're ready to go in the spring again. Right. So, so we're, we're just trying to help replace the nature since we are, we pull the plants out and we don't let them die right there. Yeah, and you're going for maximum yields in your your square footage. So um, you're you're trying to replace nature, but you're also, um, I mean, we, like we use um, specific sprays or, or liquid nutrients um, at each stage of, say, a cannabis plant. So a cannabis plant loves about a thirty to one fungal to bacterial ratio. So your IMO or your tending of the microbial life in your soil is um, going to be the huge component to have healthy disease resistance, um, pest resistance, even if they're healthy and have good biology, um, uh, microbiology going on in the soil. And um, But then there is, because we're kind of intensively farming, there is the need to um, apply nutrients you're, you're to get, you know, to maximize yields in your space. So bringing in uh, like a fish amino acid, a nitrogen source at the right time and the right amount um, is a big deal. And, and that's not like frowned upon in natural farming. Um, it, is, it is about uh, maximizing yields, but it's also um, recognizing that the, there's a cost to fertilizer that affects your bottom line. And as a cannabis industry, like in, in California, they're kind of going through a paradigm shift as they look look at, um, okay, I'm not going to get you know 2,500 a pound anymore. I, I I gotta I gotta figure out the new normal, which is definitely sub sub a thousand, and uh, and find out what my bottom line is now. And it might mean that they have to look at what they're paying for fertilizers and and inputs and labor and and all this stuff and um and there's there's hope you know this this doesn't have to be 
um, breaking the bank to make highly productive, um, beautiful plants. Right on. So uh, for those of you who are listening and you're just like dying for us to get to the techniques and you're less interested in the in the background that we're doing, why, make sure you stay to the second set where we're going to be uh, we're going to be talking about the, the various amendments. But for now, we're going to take our first short break and be right back. You're listening to Shaping Fire. And my guest today is Korean natural farming educator, Chris Trump. Using pesticides when growing cannabis has been common for a long time. Nowadays, though, we know better. We know that most pesticides formulated for food crops have never been tested for use with cannabis. They've been tested to be eaten in tiny doses. They have not been tested to be inhaled and especially not concentrated into a cannabis oil. Chemical residues from pesticides are not healthy for anyone, but they are especially dangerous for patients. For commercial cannabis growers, this has become very impactful. Cannabis enthusiasts and patients have gotten educated enough that they avoid growers who used pesticides. Not only that, but states across the country have begun making pesticide testing mandatory on all licensed cannabis crops. The time has come to find a better way to fight garden pests than covering your cannabis in chemicals. And there is a better way. Let some good bugs fight your bad bugs. Beneficial insects and predatory mites have come a long way since we were buying ladybugs online and putting them in the grow room and just hoping for the best. Natural Enemies Biocontrol can help you solve pest issues without using chemicals. Natural Enemies founder Shane Young learned best practices from working in the ornamental plant industry and has fine-tuned those strategies specifically for large cannabis crops. Shane works with commercial cannabis clients across the country to ensure that they keep their crops safe and pest-free without the use of chemicals. Natural Enemies has proven solutions for spider mites, aphids, thrips, russet mites, broad mites, shore flies, white fly, and others too. You can rely on Natural Enemies for expertise and excellent service. For more information, go to shapingfire.com forward slash natural enemies or simply click on their banner in this week's newsletter. As a listener of Shaping Fire, you already understand the importance of living soil when growing cannabis. When you have active microbe communities in your substrate, you go way beyond simply fertilizing with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Having active microorganisms in your substrate supports vigorous plant growth throughout the plant's root zone, making for higher yields and thriving flowers. Mammoth pea is the first organically derived microbial inoculant that focuses on your plant's nutrient cycling processes to release soil phosphorus and other micronutrients from their bound forms, making them more available to the plant. Increased levels of phosphorus will also keep inner nodes shorter and focus your plant's energy on bud production. Not only that, but the microbes act as a defense shield for the plant's rhizosphere by outcompeting potentially harmful pathogenic microbes. Pretty cool, right? Mammoth pea not only unlocks the nutrients in your soil, but it also helps protect your plant from disease. Mammoth pea's beneficial bacteria act like microbioreactors, continually producing enzymes that release nutrients. Mammoth pea was developed at a U.S. university and has been extensively tested by Colorado growers and independent laboratories. Mammoth pea is proven to increase growth and enhance blooming. One of the great things about supplementing with microorganisms is that they won't compete with whatever fertilizer program you're already running. Simply dose on top of your fertilizer schedule for increased benefits. To learn more and to find out where you can buy Mammoth Pea near you, check out their website at www.mammothmicrobes.com. Partner with microorganisms to create beautiful, thriving cannabis. Mammoth Pea. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose, and our guest this week is Chris Trump, Korean natural farming educator. So, Chris, you know, during the first set, we were kind of given a little bit of a background of it, but but in this set, we're going to talk very specific about some of the techniques that have uh, you know we're learning from Korean natural farming, and and one phrase that is throughout the literature um, is this this BSJ brown sugar jaggery. So so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about that first before we get into um, the different um, the different things we're going to do or do about it. What what is this brown sugar jaggery? Yeah, it's um, it's funny because as we as we first were learning this, as as this kind of first landed in Hawaii, 
from Korea, um, there was a significant learning curve, um, not just from learning a new method, but um, just a translation um, journey where not only are we translating from Korean to English, we're translating from Korean culture, um, idioms, um, and, and indigenous plants and products to um, English and American mindset. So that was, that was a huge process for kind of everybody involved. So it's, um, it, it's something hopefully that in the education going forward, um, people don't have to go through that that painstaking journey that uh, we went through in the beginning and they can uh, learn from the years of experience we've had since then. Um, but brown sugar um, is used in Korean natural farming and a lot of the fermentation um, processes um, with fruits and plants and um, was a vital component. Um, salt is used, but brown sugar and jaggery, it's, um, that was one thing in here in America, you go to Costco and you buy brown sugar and uh, really that's processed sugar with some molasses added back in um, to make it brown. Um, so it was white sugar and then they browned it with adding the molasses <laughs> back in. And uh, so when this, um, when it was first communicated, what they were talking about is just kind of the cheap unprocessed sugar you can get in Korea or um, some of these other Asian countries, which is just kind of lightly processed cane sugar. So it still has, you know, kind of the natural molasses in it. And uh, so that's, that's kind of mainly what that's talking about. But if you can just get brown sugar from Costco, that works. Or if you get some unprocessed sugar, there's a bunch of different types that are available in the U S where it's just kind of, you know, sugar in the raw, you don't want to buy that. They, they got a brand name on that. It's, it's a really expensive, but it's, it's the same concept. It's just unprocessed cane sugar or, or less processed. Right on, right on. That makes a lot of sense. But the, the word jaggery, it sounds so exotic though, right? It's like you know, unprocessed sugar doesn't, doesn't have the same spin to it, but, but at, least, at least you know it's the same thing. So, all right. So let's start at the top of the list with these amendments. Um, I, I put them uh, in an order of what, at least to me anyway, seems like it's increasing complexity. And I've only made it through the first few. Um, but uh, my goal here is that we can, we can start with something that sounds simple so that folks who are listening are like, oh, well, you know, I can do that. And and then, and then as we go through this long second set, they'll get increasingly um, more complex. Like, like we'll probably lose some people at fish amino acids, for example. So, uh, so let's start with maltose. So, so, so break down how people would use maltose and, and why. Yeah, maltose is something used in um, Korean fermentation um, in a bunch of different ways. And... Um, in the U.S., that kind of translates um, into um, our, some of the things we use for beer um, production. Um, maltose, um, for us as um, American farmers, is super helpful and not absolutely necessary. So um, it's as we looked at kind of translating these concepts from uh, Korean culture where some things are super readily available and everybody knows how to do it to um, U.S. culture and what we have available. Um, a lot of, some of the maltose use got dropped in place of just getting an inexpensive beer um, rather than making your own um, rice beer or um, rice wine, um, which maltose is used for. So, so it's interesting because, like, you know, when I, when I first got started, I'm like, all right, you 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 sprout the barley, and then and then you 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 crush it, and then you you remove the foam from the top, and I I continued to look for something that I would then put that in. No, I didn't know any better, and I I just I just added it to my 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 water that I was using to. Uh, you know, my, my rainwater that I was using for the plants. But um, are you saying that, that folks are not really using this as much anymore because there are other KNF techniques that 
you know, cover that same ground? Or are you saying that people just don't bother making it themselves anymore? Yeah, it's, um, so if you wanted to make your own brown rice vinegar, um, you could go through this uh, elaborate process to make the brown rice vinegar and, and maltose is involved. If you wanted to make um, uh, makgeolli, which is um, a Korean rice beer, which is really tasty and I highly recommend going on that journey if that interests you. But um, yeah, we've actually just, that's kind of been edited out of the the journey for um, kind of an American natural farmer. Um, for the most part, it's still cool and it still has a role if you wanted to make it, but you can do natural farming without ever um, creating your own maltose. Yeah, and it's something that I only bothered to do once because as soon as I got turned on to the second one we're going to talk about, um, you know, making lactic acid bacteria from a rice water wash, that seemed to be the first one that really hit and caused my plants to jump. So so would you explain a rice water wash and, and how to ferment it and, and why this matters to cannabis plants? Yeah, so a lot of um, what you can buy um, in the store, if somebody's making you a um, microbe amendment, uh, a lot of it is based in the um, lactobacilli family of um, bacteria, which spans a bunch of little subcategories. And um, the idea in Korean natural farming's LAB, lactic acid bacteria, um, is that you can culture it from your area, from the air, um, and, um, and make it yourself in a really effective and simple method, and then have freshly brewed, kind of highly active um, lactic acid bacteria from your environment um, to apply on your farm. And uh, it's not super expensive, though milk isn't super cheap. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty doable and accessible for farmers. And I think a lot of, a lot of the um, kind of probiotic cannabis farmers probably started with the LAB. So will you go ahead and for the people who have, who, have, who have never created this, I mean, it's not very complex. Would you walk them through, walk us all through um, a, a recipe that they can kind of wrap their heads around? I mean, obviously, if somebody really wants to get into this stuff, they're going to follow up on the episode that we're, you know, doing today with some, with some Googling and, you know, to, you know, to get something that's line by line. But, but so people can get their heads wrapped around it. Would you explain how one would do it? Sure. Yeah, so um, it's funny because I, I grew up in Hawaii. I was born and raised in Hawaii, and the uh, everybody knows to make rice in Hawaii. It's it's just culture, um, and and coming to you know being involved in mainland U.S., some people are like, okay, what do you do with rice? And so in the normal, it, often when you make rice, you'll give it a rinse first. Um, it's it's just kind of to take some of the extra kind of dust off your rice. It um, not everybody does it that way, but but it makes it less for, sticky. You know, it makes it less it makes sticky, it a little right. less sticky. Yeah. yeah. So um, for this lab recipe, you you take your rice as if you were going to make yourself a pot of rice, and you just um, fill fill up some water in your dry rice and rinse it around, and the rice the water will become kind of milky and white, and uh, you pour that off into a clean container. Now, one place people always or often fail um, in this process is by having a little soap scum left in the container they just washed out for this. So if you have soap left in that jar where you pour your rice wash water, um, it won't go properly. It won't actually produce um, the, the bacteria's will be inhibited by um, the soap remaining in that jar. So just make sure a real thorough rinse. Pro tip there. Um, but go ahead and, and uh, take that rice wash water, set it on, in, a, in a cool and um, hopefully not direct sunlight spot 
with a breathable lid, like a piece of paper towel or paper napkin, um, and let that sit for about anywhere from one to three days, um, generally, it, depending on your temperature. If it's really warm where you are, this might only take a day. Um, if it's cooler, um, you know, in the 50s, uh, it could take um, up to five days. If you can put it outside without it getting messed with, that'd be great. So if you have it under a tree and it's protected from the rain and the wind's able to blow over it, you're going to get all, this, the, all the good biology uh, micro, microbes floating in the, floating in the breeze. Um, that can jump in there. But um, generally, a lot of what's um, going to be in there is just, you know, what was in the air when it got poured in and, and on your hands even, which, you know, use clean hands when you make this. And um, after about two or three days, um, it will change its smell. And this is ever so slight. It's a very slight alteration in smell. So you want to be smelling it regularly and all of a sudden it'll have just the slightest sweet smell um, to put a taste to a smell but it's um it's just a little bit of a hint of fermentation just just the slightest change so if you sense just a tiny change it's probably ready um, if it smells at all rotten or super sour um, it went too long you missed that sweet spot um, and then you take that rice wash water and you add it in a jar um, at a rate of one part rice wash water to 10 parts milk. Um, if you can get whole milk, um, that's great. And uh, it can be store-bought. It doesn't have to be organic. It's, if, you, if you're going to drink it um, yourself, you know, as a, as a you know, health Thing, then you probably go for the milk that you would want to drink. But if you're feeding it, if you're putting it on soil, um, I would just encourage you to uh, not spend a ton of money on this. And um, yeah, add it one part rice wash water to 10 parts milk. Um, put it in a cool um, and place out of direct sunlight with a uh, breathable lid again, like a paper towel. You can use a rubber band to put it around the lid. Um, and, uh, you leave that and should be around five days, two to five days. Um, and you'll have a, uh, separating of the curds and the whey, um, just like Miss Muppet ate when she sat on her tuffet. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, so the yellow serum or the clear serum that forms, um, in the jar is you, your whey proteins, and that's where all your LAB activity is going to be. And then the curds is your casein um, protein. So the two proteins in milk will separate due to fermentation. You, you extract your curds or strain them out. You can let some of the whey. I, I like to use something that's fine as a T-shirt cloth. Um, if you use something too thick like a strainer or too um, porous like a strainer, you're going to get a lot of um, cloudiness from the curds going stain in your LAB um, serum. And uh, really, you want it to be clear. So I like to use something like a T-shirt. And then, uh, yeah, you pull off your curds. You can make cheese with that or, or just eat them, mix them with some something and eat them. You can feed them to your livestock or your animals. They'll love them, um, and it's great for them. And then that that liquid, that clear liquid that you have left, you can store in your fridge with a breathable lid, but that you can use on your plants at a rate of one to a thousand. So one part LAB to a thousand parts water. And um, it's excellent for all kinds of things. There's a ton of applications of that in the natural farming toolkit, but uh, that's the, the basics. And as far as adding it to your cannabis plants goes, um, there's a you know there's a lot of different ways that you can use it. But the, I would say that uh, you know people should know that they can both pour it into their soil directly, but it also works really great as a foliar, right? Yeah, yeah. So at, at the rate of one to a thousand, it's really safe. It's not going to cause shock or um, or you know any any kind of um, over 
um, concentration issues. One of the things that I was curious about is, is that, you know, once, once you've gotten to this point and it's in your fridge and your ratio is one to a thousand, you know, chances are that the, the, that the LAB that you have made, it's going to last for a while, but, but I don't really know how long and if there's a way that you can uh, extend the life of it so you're not having to make it, you know, every couple of weeks. Uh, what's your experience? You know, I, I feel like um, in a fridge with a breathable lid, you have vitality for anywhere from one to two months. So um, don't feel like that's, that's you got to use it within the week. It's still real viable um, within a couple months. I, I wouldn't go beyond a couple months. I think uh, that third month, it's, you're probably losing some of the vitality you had initially. But at that temperature, um, in a refrigerator, it's really everything's going to slow down and kind of just go to sleep or, or calm down a lot of their processes. And, um, yeah, so you, you're really going to get a, a great storage in a fridge. If you had to store without refrigeration, you could mix it, um, equal mass with brown sugar. Um, so you can, measure that by weight or, or generally volume, you really want to put a ton of brown sugar in. So it's all the water's kind of tied up um, in that. Um, and, and you can store that. That stores less. I would say a month would be the max on a non-refrigerated kind of um, brown sugar storage. Uh, it's not recommended to store it with molasses. Some people do that. Um, that's, um, that's not really... Uh, recommended in Korean natural farming, um, but you got to do what you can with what you got. So, yeah, right yeah. on. <laughs> Um, all right on. So, um, so, so let's move on to our next amendment because rice water wash is great. And, you know, for people who are new to this, it is a, you know, I, I can speak for myself. It is a, uh, it is a good confidence builder, right? When you do that, when you do that as simple as it is and, and it goes right, you're like, all right, I'm ready to go. What's next. And for me, the next one that we're going to talk about fermented fruit juice, um, also all over the in uh, internet as FFJ, this was the first thing that I came across that I'm like, all right, this is different. What is this? And I, and then I heard the term Korean natural farming for the first time. So similar to like what we just did with the rice water wash, would you explain fermented fruit juice and, and, and then how, how you choose your fruits and, and then how you do your ferment? Yeah. Um, let me touch on if it's all right with you, Shango, the, some of the misconceptions I've seen um, on the internet Please. regarding FFJ. Yeah. Um, so FFJ is used in natural farming in a fairly limited um, kind of um, amount. So we use it for ripening promotion um, in fruit and uh, a few other um, inputs. But um, in, in the cannabis world, it seemed to have been adopted as a thing for um, fruits, um, meaning bud production. And um, I think that that's a little bit of a mistranslation of the, um, of the concepts in natural farming. And it's, it's not so much intended for that purpose. Believe it or not, FPJ is actually what you want for that. And, um, and we can get into that next, I'm, I'm sure, fermented plant juice. So fermented fruit juice, and then the second um, kind of misnomer I've seen in um, just some of the information on the internet is that you just want to buy the best things you can from the store um, to make your FFJ with, and that all these tropical fruits we're using in Hawaii or these um, things are the best, when, um, again, that's not really the case. What you want to get if you're doing FFJ is you want to find the things that you can find wild in your environment. So if there's... This goes all the um, way back to what you started with, right? That you want to use the microbes that you find in your neighborhood so that they, they live where you grow. Yeah, there's, there's, some, there's some real benefit to getting the beneficial biochemicals that are in the plants that thrive in your environment and the um, 
plant growth hormones that are fresh. They're not something that was picked green, got ripe in the truck coming across the world and has been sitting and kind of calming down in all its um, really vibrancy for weeks and um, before it even gets to ferment in your fermentation vessel. Um, and then it has none of its um, yeast and bacteria on its surface that helped it grow because that was all bleach washed off. And so people get these really funky green molds um, and stuff forming on the top. And that's mostly because none of that bio, um, my, none of those microbes that worked with that plant for it to grow um, in, in a symbiotic way um, were present when they began their fermentation. So they're just getting um, whatever was on their hands or in their jar, or um, which isn't really sufficient or proper for this type of fermentation that we're trying to accomplish. We really want a plant to ferment in its own um, microbiology um, or microorganisms. Um, yeah, so that's that's a misnomer. So FFJ is a combination of three ripe fruits. So this could be strawberries. It could be um, it could be even like things we don't normally eat, like um, Oh man, I can't think of off the top of my head Pacific Northwest, but like, like rose hips. If you're thinking about North, yeah, rose hips are great. Yeah, I see all kinds of those. Um, yeah, all, rose hips, squash. Um, you know, um, yeah. There's there's all kinds of um, a, anything that you can think of that ripens to a ripe fruit, even if it's wild and kind of not really a normal thing you would eat, but say the birds eat it, those are all your, your ripe fruits. And so you could harvest those, um, with FFJ, you can use up to three fruits and it's actually recommended to use three varieties of fruits. So it's more and complex then, bio biologically. Yeah. And also, um, just ripe fruits have kind of, they've, they've processed to a different kind of, um, profile in, in kind of what's going on in biochemicals and plant growth hormone and all that stuff, which is, you know, it's, it's not, it's a part of it. We don't, science is working hard to understand all that's going on there. But um, yeah, so three, part, three different fruits, you mix it with equal weights brown sugar. So if you have five pounds of a variety of fruit, you get five pounds of brown sugar generally. Um, if your fruit's really dry, um, maybe your rose hips have almost no moisture in it, you could start with less sugar. Um, for, but generally, the rule is one-to-one -one sugar by weight. You massage it together, break up your fruits, chop it up, whatever. So you kind of mash it. Um, you put it in a jar, this, this mash that you've just done. You put it in a jar to ferment for about five to seven days. Um, and it'll separate, you'll have liquid and solids, and um, it really undergoes a cool fermentation process. That amount of sugar um, is so that it doesn't run away. Now, when you go to store it, so you strain it off, your solids can be strained out, so you just have your liquid left. Um, if you used less sugar than one-to-one, -one, or if it seems like it's still really active when storing, um, you can add sugar. You want to kind of maximize the um, the the sugar so that all the water molecules are kind of tied up and it stops fermenting. Because if you have too much water, it'll keep going into alcohol. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't want it to become a strong alcohol. We want it to kind of stay in that minor fermentation that it did just in that five to seven days. And uh, then... That you can store with a breathable lid at room temperature, and that keeps for a long time. That can keep for six months, um, really, and, and be viable. Um, and uh, you use that on your farm at a rate of one to five hundred. When you're when you're brewing up your fermented fruit juice, you're using a a permeable top on that. Well, just like the rest of these, right? Like the cheesecloth or something, because you're you you both want to have the 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 air exchange, and you want to invite air bound you know yeasts and things, right? Yeah, yeah, and with F 
FJ and FPJ, we expect that we have a lot of our um, microbes already in there. Um, but yeah, we want that, that breathability, that, that gas exchange um, that'll happen um, because the microbes, they'll be using oxygen and uh, just like us, they, they breathe. You know, one of the things, uh, you know, my, the first time I tried to make this, I used store-bought stuff. And you're right, when 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 fruits travel, I mean, I, I used papaya because that's what the literature was saying, right? But the papaya has traveled a really long way. And in a lot of ways, they try to sterilize it as much as they can for travel because they don't want it to rot along the way. So you're getting a version of the fruit, definitely not what the locals where it was grown were eating. And um, a local friend of mine said, you know, I explained to him my issue and why my first FFJ didn't work. And he says, just go glean off the trees, you know, whatever, whatever's near your house, because it's, it's not like you are, you're making this to eat. And so you necessarily need, need it to be palatable. All you need are the uh, essential ingredients of the fruit. So, so if you, you know, if you or your neighbors got an old, you know, plum tree and, you know, just just go glean off of it. And, and especially yep. if it's moving from ripe to overripe, so long as it hasn't started producing alcohol, man, there's so much biological activity in that thing. It's going to make a great FFJ. Yep. Yeah, that's ideal. Right on, right on. So so we're seeing that we want to, you know, the brewing part is easy and to get some local fruits that are, that are you know, have got all of the, the, the life stuff on the outside of it and then, and then make sure that we add enough, um, sugar. And then I was actually, I'm actually surprised that, that it lasts as long as it is just at room temperature. Um, I actually went through mine really fast because I figured that fruit, you know, I always think of fruit being unstable and it's going to go to alcohol quickly, but, but, um, it seems like if you, if you put enough sugar in, you're going to slow it down. And then at room temperature, um, like not on top of the fridge, like kombucha, it'll, it'll help it sleep even more. Right. Yeah, and, and the, the, the thing that's actually causing it to be shelf-stable is the amount of sugar. So if you added, um, you know, two parts water to that, so if you just dumped in a bunch of water, that would go off like crazy and go from alcohol to vinegar. Um, so it's the, the sugar is dry. It, it actually creates um, bonds with the water molecules and the microbes to, that do fermentation need water to do any of their process. So by this, this specific bounce of sugar or by total saturation of sugar, you've actually trapped all your, your water molecules in, in chemical bonds um, with sugar and, um, and there's not a whole lot of water available. So you've created kind of a desert environment for your microbes so they all are just kind of hanging around waiting for you to reintroduce um, water, which you do when you add FPJ at a, or FFJ at a rate of 1 to 500. That makes so much more sense to me. So, so even though the essential ingredients are there for it to continue on to alcohol, because the sugar is out of balance with the water, the microbes don't have the magic combination to continue their party on to alcohol. So they just mm -hmm. hang out until you add them to water and then you, you, you know, foliar or just um, add it to your sip or whatever you're, whatever you're going to do with it. Yep. Yeah. Um, and they, they, um, there are minor alcohols produced in that initial fermentation. Um, so there is a little bit, but yeah, they can't continue and use all that sugar because they don't have the water needed. Right on, right on. So uh, the next one we're going to talk about, uh, fermented plant juice. This one is uh, nice because you can, you know, you can wild craft, um, uh, you know, the plants that you want to use pretty much year round. Whereas, you know, if you're, if you're going to glean, you either need to do it, during fruit season or you need to get a little more creative, like with rose hips or something. So, so uh, why don't we do the same process with fermented plant juice, please? Yeah. Fermented plant juice is really similar um, to fermented fruit juice, except you don't use multiple plants in one brew. Um, if I'm going to use my SPJs and I want to use my rhubarb SPJ, um, at the same time I use my dandelion FPJ, then I could just add, you know, uh, uh, half of each to make one to 500 
and use it at that time. But for storage, they stay separate. And for the initial brew process, they stay separate. So um, that's that's specifically for, for some of the, you know, one might have a much more delicate yeast and bacteria makeup all over it that um, is going to do its fermentation and, and process it than another one. And if I combine them for fermentation, um, you're going to have, uh, you know, the dominant one or the stronger one would take over and, and you'd never even have a representation or very small of the, you know, the less dominant. So, yeah, you really, you want to make these separately um, and store them separately. But yeah, with FPJ, you can use all kinds of stuff. I used rhubarb here in Idaho uh, last year. It was incredible. There was tons of it. It was easy. It tasted amazing. If I wanted to, you know, bring in a, a new person and, and make them taste our fertilizer, um, you know, they were kind of floored by being able to drink this incredibly tasting, uh, you know, ferment we're using on plants. And uh, so that was fun. But um, you can use anything. So much is available. And what you're identifying as you look for a plant for FPJ is something that always is thriving in your environment. So you want to look like as for something that nobody ever takes care of, and it always looks beautiful and green and lush, and the bugs don't even mess with it. And so find those plants, you know. Um, like where, where I, I live, plant. we... Or, oh, yeah, ice plant's a good one. Uh, also, where I live, we have tons of horsetail, right? That was the first one I tried because everyone said, oh, the silica in it is is really great for uh, for building the strength of the cannabis plant. Sure. Yeah, horsetail's great. Um, what are some so, other examples of, of inputs like silica that we think about wanting in cannabis that we can get from other wildcrafted plants? Just just to so people can kind of get simmer on the idea of like, oh, if I want, you know, phosphorus, I can use this plant. Well, that's something that's kind of come out of the kind of um, – general thoughts online that isn't straight out of natural farming oh, um, oh. from Korea. That's, um, that's things that people have kind of done. And that's, you know, that's not necessary. That's not really something I would say is wrong. I, they, I think those are really good thoughts, but that's not out of the traditional natural farming kind of um, process with, if we wanted phosphorus or potassium or calcium, some of these things, there's inputs for that. Water-soluble calcium, WCA, or water-soluble calcium phosphate, WCAP or WCP. And um, so there are solutions for that in the natural farming toolkit. Um, but I think that, that that idea of horse tails is actually, uh, it's a great thought process. Um, but it, there's there's more to it. There's, um, we want the new growth of some of these plants we're identifying so that those growing tips um, is where a plant puts a ton of its energy. Think of T cells and plant growth hormone and, and all this stuff that, that we associate with um, potential um, energy. And uh, that's what plants kind of jams all its energy into its new growth or its, its budding fruit. So green fruit is all um, uh, categorized as FPJ material. So if you take, um, you know, half half formed apples or um, you know green plums, um, that would be an FPJ. Um, you could take rhubarb stalks and their leaves. You could take um, ice plant or ivy. Um, you can take or you could take grass. Uh, so you identify some vibrant grasses, you can make an SDJ out of that. Um, so kind of sky's the limit. Dandelion, we use dandelion, we use purslane, um, all kinds of things. That's really interesting. You just totally kind of put, put my approach to this on its head because we're not actually looking for the specific input. For example, I use the one of, of the silica in the horsetail. Actually, we want to get the microbial level you know, life force one level of magnitude down. Um, yeah, that's pretty heavy duty. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and it's, it, there's so little of this, um, 
that we're using. It's um, it's a whole system. It's not it's not just like FPJ is the one thing. FPJ is a food for the plants and and the microbes, and it is um, important. And you are getting silica if you're using horsetail. You know that is part of it. But there's there's more to it, and it's that whole system that you you're tending to the microbial life um, in the soil on the plant itself, and um, and yeah, so yeah, it isn't just like identify a phosphorus rich plant. That's that's fine, and you can, but um, but you're missing also, the bigger picture. Yeah, you're missing. Yeah, mi- you're missing the love. <laughs> yeah. Right on. It's kind of it's kind of a humility. You're kind of like okay. There's actually some things in nature that are beyond the NPK and then the 23 minor minerals. Um, there's something beyond this, and we're discovering that as we dig deeper and understanding phytonutrients and these, you know, biochemicals. We're realizing this is actually more complex than we thought it was. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And to and to steal the line from Jeff Lowenfels, this is like us teeming with the nutrients, right? This is us saying, all right, we don't necessarily yeah. understand the life force magic that happens, you know, inside of the new growth green, you know, the, the green new growth on the edge of the, on the tip of the plant. But, but we know that if we take it and, and if we fermented it a little bit to encourage it, to make more of it, whatever that, you know, unknown life forces becomes multiplied and then our cannabis plants are freaking stoked something like that and and in the in the process we're we're kind of saying and we're just trying to partner with nature we don't we're just trying to take something that's vibrant and give it um you know into our commercial growing system and um benefit from what nature is already doing well Right on, right on. So let's move on to uh, fish amino acids. I haven't done this one yet, and uh, just the, the fish aspect of it um, has, has, has caused me to, to hesitate a little bit. But, um, but, but, but please, if you will, explain you know, what, the, what the idea behind this is and what the process looks like. So this is um, probably one of the best nitrogen sources you can do, um, you can get um, for teaming with, microbial life and uh, and using things that are really um, micronized. So all of natural farming, these foliar sprays and these inputs are highly available. And m- micronization, micronized uh, is uh, nutrients is, is really, uh, it's a word, it's a thing where through fermentation and the breakdown by microorganisms of the components in these things, we're getting this this um, end product, this material that actually can be absorbed by the plant itself um, without the need for. Um, so, like if you apply chemical fertilizer, for that to ever be available to the plant, um, it actually has to be processed by some microorganism. So, you know, the people aquapon or hydroponic farmers. They're always bleaching, and then they put in their nutrients. And as soon as they put in their nutrients and the plant roots, they find that all the plant roots are colonized by bacteria. And they're like, I just bleached. Why is there this bacteria? For them, their plants even to get access to these liquid fertilizers they're putting in, they need those bacteria. Mm-hmm. And so um, for, for us, fish amino acid is, this, is really amazing fertilizer. Um, there's fish hydrolysates and uh, fish emulsions that you can buy, and both of those are good. I think hydrolysate is a little better than emulsion, but really uh, a lot of those things, they're, they're taking off the fats for a fish oil product on the side, you know, so they're double dipping in, in kind of um, productivity or, or, or profitability of their product, mm-hmm. um, they're, or they're taking off some other byproduct of the fish and using it elsewhere. So you're not getting the whole suite of what, um, uh, you know, like a fish has to offer. Whereas this fish amino acid, this fermented whole fish or, or fish waste is, um, the whole thing. And it's being highly micronized by instead of us cooking it or, um, doing these other processes, it's being fermented. 
So the breakdown's happening by microorganism. Um, yeah, it's it's a great thing. And your plants, if you actually make this in the way that um, it's supposed to be made, your plants really react. Um, they love this stuff. So. Well, then let's, uh, talk, let's talk about how it's supposed to be made. Uh, do you really need to use the blue, uh, blue-backed blue fish, as it says in the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the original treatise? Or can you, use, yeah. can you use whatever you want? Is there something special about blue-backed fish? Yeah, so uh, that blue-backed fish, for, for the sake of kind of translating that um, culturally and language, it's deep water fish. Um, they, they've taken on, uh, a different level of, um, or a different amount of the kind of minerals of the ocean. So farm raised fish or pond fish or river fish aren't going to have quite the same kind of mineral, um, tied up in their systems as deep water fish are. So you're getting this kind of, um, complexity of nutrition, um, for your plants that a deep water fish has maybe more than a river fish. So that's, that's kind of what that's talking about. Um, so can I use what fish I say, say all I have is steelhead or, or uh, tilapia. Um, can I use that and get a fish fertilizer? Yeah, you can. And there is, there is something to this deep water fish being recommended. So, um, just knowing that, okay, I don't have the best source, but I have this tilapia, that's what I have available, it's cheap and, and accessible, um, just know that there, there might be some benefit if you could get, you know, that stuff coming off the fishing vessels down at the harbor, um, you, you might get some additional benefit. Um, and that's, that's why that's recommended. So up to you. You got to – ultimately, you're king on your farm. You get to make the decisions you want to make, and you can you can do parts of this. Um, but the your, the natural farming has been thought out very thoroughly, and uh, every time I dig into the science, um, I find it's um, founded in really really good scientific thought and theory and and um, truth. So so, yeah. let's, so let's say okay. So I've either I've either gone down to the. Uh, the, the harbor and and bought a, you know a tuna or something off a boat um, or or more realistically the first time I try this I'm probably going to use something you know less expensive like tilapia or sardine something that if I screw it up you know I won't feel as quite so bad about it so so now that I have my fish how how do you go about in stacking this ferment yeah well let me clarify real quick if you go down and buy a fresh tuna off the off the fish. Make sure you get the fillets off, make yourself some sashimi, and enjoy <laughs> that with your friends. And only use the bones, the guts, and the head for, um, or, or the carcass, the guts, and the head for this fish amino acid. Don't let me hear of anybody wasting a perfectly good tuna on fertilizer for, uh, yeah, that, that would just be a tragedy. So no, none of I that. I was thinking that it sounded really expensive to use a, a whole deep water fish, but but with that with that addition, what actually might make a lot more sense is to just go to your 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 local, um, you know, Japanese market where they prepare and clean the fish, and just ask them, say, hey, can I come back at the end of the day? Can I have your you fish get, cut? Yeah, yeah, because I'm sure they'd be thrilled to give it to you, especially if you say you're doing something like exotic like this. It'd be like, oh yeah, we'll hook you up. Yeah, this is what that is. So yeah, don't don't confuse this. This is cheap. This is supposed to be the the waste products, and and a lot of times people are cooking with the heads. So you might not even get the heads. You might only get the carcass and the guts, and uh, that's fine. Some Asian cultures, you're not even gonna get it that. They're gonna they're gonna cook with all of that. But um, yeah, I actually just recently for the class I taught last November in in Boise, I uh, I just asked our local uh, sushi. Um, shop if uh, if they had any uh, fish heads they got all their tuna came pre filleted so I couldn't get any tuna but I got all their salmon heads and carcasses they gave them uh, a cooler of those to me and so I I have fish amino acid brewing in my office that doesn't smell at all um, and and I share that that office I have two offices where I work and that office is shared with like six other people. And, uh, 
nobody even knows it's there and it's it's basically rotting fish but it's no, it's not rotting it's, it's aerobically fermenting fish anyways here's the process Excellent. so so you take your fish waste as we've established not not the fillets eat those fish waste equal weight brown sugar you, you sensing a the theme here yeah i get it <laughs> okay equal weights brown sugar um a dash of IMO4, so I am very intentionally not giving you a specific measurement. You don't have to have a super specific measurement. This is just a light inoculum, so just a, a handful of IMO4 um, for that fermentation, that kind of really skewing your, your microbe. For folks who don't uh, know what IMO4 is, will you, will you briefly hit that? Yeah, so that's, that's I've taken microbes out of my local forest, I've multiplied them out on substrate. Um, it's a th it's a four step process. So the number four just refers to it's the fourth stage in the process of taking it out of the forest and getting it ready for my farm. Um, so it's just uh, indigenous inoculum. So you could take a handful of leaf litter out of your local forest if you didn't have IMO four. Um, so a handful of inoculum whether it's leaf litter out of your forest or IMO4. IMO4 is ideal. Um, and then just a little bit of um, just a splash of OHN if you have it. OHN is another natural farming ferment. I have a YouTube video on how to make it um, oriental herbal nutrient. Anyways, don't worry about those. If you don't have those, you could still make this. But I would recommend going out to the forest and getting some visible spiderwebby mycelium in a handful and throwing it in here. But if you don't have that, you can still make it. So um, the basic process is equal weights brown sugar and um, put it in a cooler and leave it to ferment over time. The absolute earliest you would want to extract that in the natural farming um, recipe would be three months. And truthfully, that's too soon. It's not going to be finished. So best is a year. If you just throw it in a cooler, you can put a lid on it. You don't, you want to, whatever you do, you want to set it up so rats or some rodent can't get in and ruin all your hard work. Um, but what I'll usually do is stick a mesh over it and throw a lid on it loosely so no rodents can get in. A little bit, a little bit of air can transfer. Um, airflow is positive, but sometimes it's hard to find a container where it can both breathe and be closed. Um, and protected. But yeah, then you leave it for a year. What you'll have is you'll have just the bones left over and you'll have this like blackish liquid. It'll be straight liquid fish. And uh, it, it smells and tastes like uh, fish sauce that you buy at the store for cooking. Mm -hmm. um, it's, really, it's really a positive smell and taste. Um, yes, I've tasted my fish amino well, acid. I, I, I've made it with fresh tuna off the coast of Hawaii and brown sugar and a handful of IMO4 that I made myself and kept it nice and, and clean in a, in a fresh uh, cooler. And, uh, and then it came off and it's just this beautiful, uh, if you could make food with it, you know, this could be instead of making plant fertilizer, you just made fish sauce for cooking, but really it is, um, it's great cheap fertilizer. So how do you know if it goes bad, right? Like, uh, like, if, like if it starts to smell, is that a good, um, a good suggestion that something went along, wrong along the process? Yeah, if you do it, if you do it according to this recipe, it really doesn't go bad. Um, but if you didn't have an inoculum, um, you could have a a month period where it smelled kind of foul. Um, but that also probably means there was something wrong with your ratio of fish to sugar. Um, or something like that. If, if you find, if it seems like there's way too much liquid, you may need to add a little extra sugar. Um, if it, you know, that's anyway, you don't worry about that, but really it shouldn't smell. Um, something's probably gone wrong. Um, but if you can get just even a handful of soil from a wild environment could, could be all you need. You just need some kind of inoculum, um, yeah. Right on. Good. 
Wow. All right. Well, this is clearly the uh, the longest uh, uh, segment of Shaping Fire that we've ever done here at 50 Minutes. So let's go ahead and take our second uh, break, and we'll be right back. You're listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Korean natural farming educator Chris Trump. While I certainly still enjoy smoking joints, I moved over to using vaporizers about three years ago. The high was a little different than burning the flower, and in the end, I decided I preferred it for daily use, especially because I have asthma. More importantly, though, I could taste my flower so much more. It's hard to express to you how significantly different cannabis with a good terpene profile tastes when vaped instead of burned. I have brought my vape with me to visit growers, and they are astonished by the clarity of taste, and they say they feel like they're tasting their flower for the very first time. The Air Vape Vaporizer from AirVapeUSA.com is a great device to use on the go or at home. When you pick it up, it feels satisfying like a medical device. It isn't flimsy like many vapes are. I like how the flower is inserted in the top instead of the bottom, so it travels a shorter path to my mouth. With the cannabis at the top, I get a hit that feels more substantial, even though I'm just inhaling vapor and not full-bodied smoke. Since I use this vape for flour, hash, and concentrates, I really like that the digital control for the temperature is right there on the front. Three clicks of the button and it fires up to the temperature I specify really quickly and discreetly. You know, vape concentrates are a milder experience than dabbing, but you still get the potency in your hit. Also, the taste is great, as would be expected with a low temp dab. I love that this vape gives quick little vibrations when it gets to the right temperature. That way, if I'm chatting or distracted while it's heating up, it lets me know when it's ready. If you are ready for a nice pocket-sized vaporizer, consider the Air Vape. The new Air Vape X has just come out, and it's gorgeous and it includes many updates. You can find more about the Air Vape vaporizer at airvapeusa.com. If you grow cannabis with sunshine, you can often feel limited by the seasonal cycle. You want to grow sustainably and save money, so you use as little electricity as possible. But if you haven't studied or implemented light deprivation techniques into your greenhouse, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. By incorporating light deprivation solutions into your greenhouse, you can often add two or three additional growing cycles to your year. When you pencil out the financial benefit of those additional cycles, you'll realize why commercial scale light deprivation technology is remaking the cannabis industry. What used to be done by pulling tarps over hoop houses has been scaled up over the last few years in such a way that it's become mechanized, easy, and affordable to even small-scale commercial cannabis operations. Forever Flowering Greenhouses is the industry leader in light deprivation, greenhouse design, and operation for the commercial cannabis industry. Their team of greenhouse experts have been in the fields of Northern California for decades, and they're now building greenhouses for commercial cannabis companies across the country. If you are new to light depth and growing in greenhouses, I encourage you to go back to Shaping Fire episode 13 with guest Eric Brandstad of Forever Flowering. I talk with Eric about the importance of intelligent greenhouse management as well as the huge financial benefit of incorporating light depth techniques. There are so many aspects of utilizing a greenhouse that can go wrong. From temperature and airflow to light depth and workflow, Forever Flowering will help you produce crop after crop of well cared for flowers. They can help you retrofit your existing greenhouse with light depth and other modern systems at a level that fits your budget. If you're just starting out, Forever Flowering can help you plan and build your new greenhouse so that you get started on the right foot. The cannabis business has enough risks without trying to go it alone with your greenhouse. Contact Forever Flowering Greenhouses to partner with folks who have an indisputable reputation as knowledgeable and easy to work with. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash FFG to find out more. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shangalos, and our guest this week is Chris Trump, Korean natural farming educator. So if you're still with us after uh, the second set, I appreciate you staying with us. You are either here for uh, Chris Trump and you're not a regular listener, or if you are a regular listener, um, you just totally got indoctrinated into Korean natural farming. So here on this last set, we're going to talk about a couple uh, different topics. And uh, the first one we're going to start out with is uh, one of my favorites since I live on an island here, uh, and that's fermented seawater. And I got to tell you, Chris, when I first, uh, you know, read this, I thought it was a typo or something. How, how do we go about fermenting seawater? It's, it's really cool because it, the, it's kind of philosophically in, in natural farming, the concept is we, we, we rose out of the ocean. Ocean is the mother of life. And, um, so you have all the ocean, 
you know, mineral components in soil and um, human blood is very similar. And actually plant blood, quote unquote, or uh, cytoplasm is very similar to seawater as well. And actually plant, um, quote, blood is um, very similar to seawater diluted at a rate of one to 30. And so in natural farming, you'll see seawater is used at a dilution rate of one to 30. Basically, you're using something very similar to plant blood. Like, so when we're at the hospital, we maybe got dehydrated or something, we're getting an IV of saline um, because it helps us, um, you know, process stress or dehydration. And um, this is really actually a quite similar concept. Fermented seawater is um, giving some microbes access to all those great minor minerals in seawater um, along with some plant material. So fermented seawater is ocean water 1 to 30, um, LAB 1 to 700, and I think FPJ 1 to 300, um, somewhere in there. Sorry, uh, off the top of my head, but it's it's fermented for 24 hours. You can ferment it longer um, or store it in a vessel, and it can just kind of stay fermented seawater. But if you're raising animals and you want to kind of cheaply better your pasture land, this is a great, great thing to spray on grassland. Um, it's also just something you can spray on your crops. Um, somewhat regularly, you know, weekly or every other week um, with a great result and, uh, again, almost no cost. So the, the ratios that you give for the inputs, those ratios are all to fresh water, right? Yep. Right on. Yep. Does it matter? I mean, I'm assuming that with most of these things, we want to use – um, rainwater is probably best or perhaps RO, but we want to stay away from our chlorinated tap water, I would assume. Yeah, if you want to stay away from chlorinated tap water, um, RO is actually really um, a vacuum, um, uh, minerally speaking. So it's, it's um, like distilled water and RO are, are fairly similar. And you want to be careful um, – that can be kind of shocking to plants, actually, because it's so such oh, a it vacuum. Oh, can suck stuff out. Yeah, it, they, the water is so readily uh, bonded to so many things that it actually can pass through your system and draw mineral rather than, um, you know, and that, that can have uh, consequences. Yeah, that's interesting. Right on. So, so you you make it in this. You put it together, fresh water with the uh, with the uh, salt water, the FPJ, and um, what was the third ingredient? LAB. Oh, the light. Yeah, that's right. The LAB. And and then how long do you let it ferment? How do you how do you know when you're you're ready to go? It's just twenty four hours. Oh. So um, you can go longer. But yeah, LAB is that thing we make with the rice wash and the milk, um, that serum. And so your your that's your fermenter. Um, your plant juice is kind of like a, a, a nutrient. And and this came um, over hundreds of years of observation of different things that farmers did, um, where basically they found that if they took you know um, these minor minerals and some plant component through fermentation the leftover liquid did gangbuster cool things to crops. And there was often done accidentally or, you know, so like in Korea, they make kimchi and the kimchi water dumped out all their plants, wherever they dumped their kimchi water went ballistic and were the tastiest and sweetest. And so they found that though that mineral, that minor mineral allows plants to do um, complex sugar making which we associate with um, flavor. Yeah, that makes sense. And the other thing, you know, not only does the seawater have all of those those micro minerals, but it also has got you know entirely different communities of uh, you know microbial activity. And so, it if, true. yeah, and you, you you feed those guys some uh, some FPJ and uh, wait, which did you say? Fermented fruit juice or the plant juice goes into this? 
Plant juice. Plant yep. juice, right. So you give them that nutrient, I bet you they would uh, multiply super fast. Yeah, and for those landlocked people, if you don't have ocean water or you got to drive eight hours to get some, and that's just not realistic, um, you could get some sea salt and put it into water at a rate of 30 grams per liter um, to make the, so basically that's seawater, 30 grams to one liter of fresh water is now you have a bottle of seawater and then you can dilute that one to 30. Or if you wanted to skip the dilution step, you could put one gram per one liter and then you have a dilution of one to 30. Or it's a great uh, excuse to go on a beach vacation. <laughs> Just bring, there you bring, go. bring back water with you. Just do it fast. Cause I'm sure that those uh, microbes don't like to hang out in containers very long. No, you know, um, seawater keeps really nicely. Mm. So um, in landlocked places in Korea, they actually go and they'll get a tanker and they fill these, um, they have these underground storage vats and they just fill these big old vats and then as they need it, they pull it out. Oh, great. So um, let's talk about uh, water-soluble minerals. I mean, we talked about that a little bit earlier when when you redirected me about the silica that I the, from the horsetail I was using, and uh, you you alluded to that there, you know there's actually something in Korean natural farming for these these minerals in case you want to you know turn if you got to turn up your calcium if you got to turn up your phosphoric acid. So why don't you break down what water-soluble minerals are in KNF? Yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of those and um, and some of them are with with acid and rock and and that's some some proprietary things that Master Cho does and uh, that knowledge will kind of trickle out over the next several years, but um, but the the basics and that are really important are um, water soluble calcium phosphate, so that's kind of your phosphorus. Um, water soluble calcium and then water soluble potassium WSK. So those are WCA is the calcium, WCP is sometimes used or WCAP for calcium phosphate and then WSK for potassium. Sorry, I just rattled those off. And then to create them, um, uh, I have some videos on uh, phosphorus and calcium. You can check out on YouTube, but the um, Basic recipe is that you take eggshells, or if you had access to coral sand, you could use that too. But eggshells, you heat them in a pan until they kind of um, they kind of cook past, so the organic matter kind of chars off, and you have just kind of the the calcium uh, of eggshells. You throw them in brown rice vinegar, so now you have this highly basic material, this calcium rich material and you throw it in an acid and you get a chemical reaction where the acid yanks out all this calcium and you take calcium, now you have calcium in solution or micronized through that chemical process. So you have a water soluble calcium, highly plant available. And we use that at a rate of one to a thousand. And then for phosphorus, we take bones. So any, any old butcher bones or, or whatever you have, um, you could even go out to uh, a ranch and get, you know, sun bleached bones out, out on the, out on the range and, um, take them, you throw them on the fire, you char them basically like you want to make biochar. Mm -hmm. So if you have a biochar process already, that's great, but you char them. So they're past the organic matter. So they're just down. You've kind of, you've kind of charred off all the organic matter and they're down to kind of their, um, mineral. And so they're, they're kind of a solid black, even some, some white on the edges turning to ash is, isn't terrible, but if it's all white, it's gone to ash. It's really not good. You want to get it kind of at a, at the point where it's, um, e even if it's some ash, it's fine. Even if it's some white, but it's, you don't want it to be brown, um, where it's still got a bunch of organic matter. So I have, I show that in the video, but it's, it's, um, down to its mineral. Again, you throw that in a brown rice vinegar and um, it reacts and yanks out all that mineral um, and puts it into solution and you can spray that foliarly and uh, it's highly plant available. So that helps you at these specific stages in plant development, um, you know, uh, in, in vegetative growth, you're going to want that calcium kind of, um, kind of banging in there uh, in more so. 
And then in uh, that changeover, as it goes, just before it goes into flowering in natural farming, we encourage the use of the water-soluble calcium phosphate. And, um, and then some more as it um, uh, makes, um, makes its fruit. <clears throat> For folks who have never done uh, biochar and the idea of, of you, know, you know, charring this stuff is new, um, uh, how long would you say, and I haven't actually done bone, um, you know, if, if you're going to say take a, take a small amount of bones and put it in a, uh, like an old coffee can or something and, 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 and cover it with foil and you put it on the grill or something like that, how long would you uh, say that it would take for bone to reach this mineral state we're shooting for? You know, it's really going to depend on what your setup is. Um, if you're just doing it on an open grill with an open fire, you can kind of watch it change. Um, so that might be a way to do it initially. But it kind of if you're doing some kind of enclosed thing, um, it's going to depend on your heat of your fire and, and uh, how you set it up. But on the grill, um, open flame, it takes probably uh, 30 minutes um, if you're just turning it with some barbecue tongs or something right on and that's what i was going for is i i just wanted to hear that 30 minutes so people understood this is not like a five hour thing this is actually mm -hmm. uh, e even though we made it sound a little more exotic you know with the bones um it's it's actually you know not not all that hard to do the recipe once you have the bones i mean clearly the the eggshells are a lot easier to get yeah that's true yeah. So, um, so to, to finish off the show, Chris, I want to reward all of the hardcore, uh, Korean natural farming folks who, who not only recommended you for the show, um, but also were like cheering me on for having you on the show. Cause you know, you're, you are, you are certainly a, uh, you know, I don't think you'd refer to yourself as a celebrity, but I can refer to you as a celebrity in KNF. So, so I want to invite you to go over my head, right? I, I only know t what to ask you based on, the the little bit I've learned so far and and the you know the questions that people suggested me so so I'd like you to go over my head and and talk about something that that you're excited about right now that will be you know a nice reward to the KNF people who who stayed with us throughout the show and we're waiting for you to like drop something you know heavy over my head so 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 please if you would you know what what have you been excited about recently that you that you want to share yeah, there's, um, you know, this, this journey in KNF is, um, it's, it's deep because it's really a pursuit of understanding and partnering with nature, which it, it's, the interconnectivity is, is mind boggling. Um, and science is just kind of beginning to scratch the surface of how things are interconnected. Um, one thing I'm really enjoying, um, something I'm kind of pursuing and playing with, is substrates for growing out IMO and some of the best um, media for that. And uh, what I found over the years is that um, there's, uh, there's things that certain microbes like better to chew on than other things. And so... In Korea, they use a rice bran to grow, um, to do this IMO one through, or IMO three and four process. And, um, rice bran is rich in fat. Um, in the U.S., they started doing, uh, mill run because it was the kind of comparable thing that was cheap and readily available. Um, like a, a by, uh, agricultural byproduct that was readily available. But as we've looked at it, um, mill run is way um, lower in um, fat content than a rice bran. So as far as fungal food specifically, um, fungi love um, fats. So the, the cell wall of a plant is full of um, fats. So it's these, these complex and tied up fat um, chains. But but cell walls are um, full of them in like in plant cells. So that silica, you know, people are like, oh, silica is great. Well, why does silica, ha why is there so much? And, and um, uh, mic microbes, that, that smaller, you know, bacteria is really easy. Everybody's buying these bacilluses and, and stuff. But these 
these fungi, these, these um, microbes that tend to have relationship with plants in a unique way in their root structure um, really require some of these, um, I'm saying fats, but these lipids and these, these things that we, you know, like silica, um, where, where it's this kind of these complex chains that are created and, and fungi get in and they break apart these, these fatty acid chains and they use the acids and the, and the, the lipids. And um, so what I've found is that the, this, the substrates are important. So in Hawaii, I switched from using like messing around with mill run and I used a byproduct from our industry, which was um, kind of off grade macadamia nuts. And I combined that with carbon, um, like a macadamia shell or wood chip or sawdust. And I found incredible fungal growth and diversity um, could be uh, fostered in, in that kind of a substrate. And uh, so, um, yeah, I'd encourage you if you can find uh, rice bran or some of these other um, grains that have their own uh, decent fat profile, um, that might be cool to bring into your, your material as you make your IMO3 um, as a, a food for your, your bigger organisms like uh, a large hyphal diameter fungi, you know, because they, they are really important in the whole um, process of cultivating a soil food web in your, in your farm. You know, yeah, it, it makes sense too, right? Because mill run is going to be so processed and, and, and the, and the rice, you know, it's, it's got the full fat. It would make sense that that would be, um, more of what nature wants to respond to instead of a, a thinned out processed product. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fun. It's a fun journey just to kind of, you know, see how we can uh, cultivate what nature already does. Yeah. Right on. Well, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show, especially for such a long episode and, and, and not only, you know, teaching us and sharing your experience, but, um, you know, you've been at this for a lot of years. So for you to be able to, you know, capsulize it and give it context really allows the rest of us who are new to this to, uh, to jump in the deep end of the pool a lot faster. So thank you very much. Yeah, man. It's a pleasure. Right on. Glad to be here. So if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to follow Chris's YouTube channel. And uh, it doesn't have a forward slash. All you need to do, though, is to just search uh, Chris Trump and uh, KNF. Or actually, I got it just by putting in Chris Trump. Uh, you can follow his Instagram, which you know is a mix of both growing and personal stuff. And that's at forward slash soil steward on Instagram. Um, he's got a new website up that is just being filled out now. So it's probably going to be better you know, in a month or two, uh, but, but that, you know, bookmark it for now. That's at naturalfarming.co is his website. Um, also, uh, Chris has got a class coming up. Um, you can find it on Eventbrite. It's, uh, it's coming up in July of 2018 and it's in Idaho. So, you know, if you, if you, if you were thinking you had to fly to Hawaii, you do not have to. And so, uh, so you can search that on Eventbrite. And finally, I want to remind you again to check out, uh, both the Korean natural farming group on Facebook and also uh, the Probiotic Farmers Alliance group also on Facebook. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and on Apple iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I'll be speaking, you can check out shangolos.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Los. Mm -hmm.